bring electrical components in the studies. This is 1040B. Okay. 1040B, we're going to break it out to several different uh, sections, but I think you'll see this repeated throughout the courses, okay? That's because the more you, you're exposed to a component or different uh, uh, parts of the HVAC system, the better off you're going to learn it. All right, the first thing that we want to cover is transformers. Well, we use a lot of transformers in the HVAC field. Now, I have a couple of transformers here on this particular board. This one and this one. Okay. One of the major differences between these two transformers is the amount of taps that's available. This transformer over here is one that is uh, one voltage only on the input and 24 volts on the output. This one is a multi-tap transformer. can be used in different, uh, very many different applications. But keep in mind, when hooking one of these up, you always want to cap off the leads that you're not using. They will have electricity on them. Now, transformers are rated in VA. That's volt amperes. Okay. One way that you can tell what the capacity of a transformer is is through Ohm's law. If you remember, P is equal to I times uh, E. That is the current times the voltage. Well, let's say that I have a 24 volt output. Okay. Standard ratings on transformers would be 20 VA or 40 VA. There are other ratings, but those are pretty standard. If we take the 40 VA, okay, that's our total power, if you will, if we divide the 24 into it, how many times is that going to go? One, and then a remainder. And someone with some good math skills, <laughs> our computer. Uh, anybody want to help me out here? <laughs> You'd say that's going to go about five times, right? Roughly a little better than five, maybe six, six, six times. Okay. All right. 1.6. So that tells me that the amp draw that I'm going to get out of that 40 VA transformer is, is, is if I go past 1.6 amps, I'm going to be exceeding the amount of amp draw that that thing's able to produce at 24 volts. So when you see the VA rating, that's what that's about. It tells you what the capacity or the, the, or the the uh, maximum amount of power that you can get out of that transformer without overloading it. Well, have you ever wondered how in the world you could have a high voltage coming in and a low voltage coming out? Or vice versa. The transformer doesn't realize whether it's, a, um, whether it's used to increase or decrease the voltage. It doesn't realize that. It's the way you hook it up. All right. It's a turn-to-turn -turn ratio. If we look at the symbol, we see this. Okay, we don't indicate this on our schematics, but th if these turns were ten as many as this one, that would be a one to ten ratio. Can you think of a place where you may see that? Okay, what about if this was two forty? What would my output be on step down transform? Twenty four. Twenty four. <coughs> Okay. Now I got something for you to think about. What if I hook this thing up backwards? If I put the 240 down here, what am I going to have coming out up here? <coughs> Ten times. Y'all see a problem? Yeah. Okay. The insulation's not going to stand up. <coughs> It's going to burn up the transformer. But if you happen to be having your hands on that and you hook it up wrong, you're going to get a hurt. So the transformer doesn't know any difference, but you do. Okay? <laughs> All right. One of the biggest problems with transformer failures is them being overloaded due to a shorted component in the secondary circuit. 
if you have a fuse in that circuit, that's hopefully that will catch it. But if you had a three amp fuse in that uh, uh, 40 VA, what's going to happen? Which is going to go first, the three amp fuse or the transformer? Three amp fuse. Hopefully the fuse, but may, may not because you've got a fuse twice as big as the capa uh, capacity of the transformer. So you, you want to keep that in mind. One of the best ways to find shorts in the secondary circuit, if you can't, you can't always find them by using ohm meters. You just, uh, sometimes things don't actually short out until they operate. But one of the best things to do is put a, a uh, circuit breaker in that circuit of the secondary and eliminate different components in the secondary until you find what's tripping the, the uh, brake. Okay. Unfortunately, some of the transformers actually have internal fuses in them. And if you exceed that rating of that internal fuse, you just blow the transformer. It's non repairable So that's where a lot of times folks will go and replace a transformer, turn the power back on, and the first time the the, the, the uh, faulty component becomes energized, they lost another transformer. What a bad transformer. Bad component somewhere in there. And the troubleshooting wasn't complete. Okay. You can ohm out the transformer by looking at the primary and the secondary. Of course, this is without power on it. Definitely have the power removed and have the leads removed when you do that. But you can do that, but that's not going to tell you exactly what killed it. Okay. Can you identify a transformer with a fuse then, just by reading it? It's, it's going to say it on it. It'll say uh, something like uh, internally protected. Okay. Uh, but it will have it on it. Okay. All right. Any questions about transformers? We'll <coughs> move something else. All right. Our next component that we want to look at is contactors. Probably the next most common device in the electrical circuits of HVACR system is going to be the contactors. Okay. I'm going to combine contactors and relays. Basically, they're both electrical switches. There's different configurations, but the biggest difference between a contactor and a relay is its ability to carry the current. Anything that is 20 amps or more is considered as a contact. 20 amps and below, you're looking at relays. All right, this is a contactor. Is that, is that a standard setting of the screw? Yeah, that's pretty standard, okay. industrial standard. Uh, contactor, contactor, contactor. This could either be a contactor or a relay. But there are some different configurations on these right uh, across here. These have a sliding armature. Notice that it goes straight up and down or, or, or in one direction only. This is a swinging type contact. This actually has an arm that on a hinge. I'll draw that up here in just a minute. These are relays. You notice we can see the contacts on some of these. Some are built internal. We cannot see them. Okay. Most of your relays are going to be built. Most of your relays are going to be built so that you can't see the contacts unless they're what we call an ice cube type. Okay, and some of those it's kind of hard to see too. But let me show you a little something about the, the uh, contactors in particular. Contactors relays. I'm going to like say you, you can, that their characteristics are very similar, other than their their uh, uh, amplicity ratings. Okay. If I'm looking at the contacts, I would see that. The coil is going to be indicated like so. I could have multiple contacts operated by the same coil. In this particular case, this would be a two-pole, normally open contact or a relay. If I have an indication like that, this would be a three-pole contactor, but I would have two normally open contacts and one normally closed. What determines whether it's normally closed or normally open is the position that it's going to be in in the de-energized mode. Okay? Now, 
sometimes these symbols will look like this. It doesn't necessarily have to follow that same format. Here we have a, this is a single pole, double throw. When it's uh, de-energized, this one's normally closed. This one's normally open. When I energize it, these two positions will swap. Okay? So that's one of the things that you need to look at on the characteristics. Another very important part of contactors and relays is their coil voltage. Also, their contact rating. There's two different types of, well, there's actually three different ratings that you need to be looking at. One is the lock rotor rating. Lock rotor is when a motor first starts up, it's called the inrush. You don't want to exceed the rating of the contacts. In other words, if you had a motor that was 100 uh, amps lock rotor, you definitely wouldn't want to put a 70 uh, lock rotor uh, rating contactor on there. You'd burn it up to start off with, okay? The other thing that you want to look at is the inductive contact rating. That's usually going to be the normal operating amperage of the contact. Also, you want to look at the resistive rating in certain applications. Well, we would have to worry about resistive ratings. It's about electric heat strips. Okay. If I have a contact that's rated for 20 amps inductive, that doesn't tell me what it's rated for resistant. Okay, so I need to look to see what the resistive contact rating would be if I'm using it on an electric heater or something of that nature, okay? All right. One other thing that you want to pay attention to is uh, in some particular relays and contacts is the orientation. Most of it doesn't matter. But most of it doesn't matter. I fell in the top. It took care of it. Uh, most of them, it doesn't matter on the uh, orientation, but some do. So keep that in mind. It's just, just, just something to look at, right? All right. Uh, Ricky, can you think of anything else on contactors and relays that we need to cover before we move into the next component? Sounds like you covered it, David. You, okay. you might want to go back over the normally. Does everybody understand normally open and normally closed? That that's a question yes. we get, you know, quite often. Is that oh, the configurations? And thank you, Ricky. You just made me think about something. If I have a contact that hinges, okay, that's called a swinging type contact or relay. If I have one that has the plunger in it, if you will. Here's the contact. And this part would move straight up and down. That's called a sliding. So when you hear sliding or swinging contact, that's what they're talking about. And there, those, those you can't probably can't see it from where you're at. But these definitely are swinging contact. See how it hinges right in that one place? Whereas these are sliding contact. Okay, made me think about something looking here. Especially with some of the higher voltages and <laughs> amperages, you have arc suppressors built into the plates on these things. If you take the cover off of the one of the, especially one of the larger contactors, do not operate that under a load. They're made there so that you can take that plate off and take a look at the contacts for an inspection, visual inspection. If you operate that with those arc shields removed, you may have a flash fire in front of your face. Okay, nobody wants that. So don't operate these with the shields removed, okay? All right, let's move into our next component that we want to spend a little time on is going to be